Hey, hey, guys! Sorry about that. <laughs> it was a little bit of internet connectivity mm. issues on our end. Apologize. So, but we're here with Rachel. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How All right, are you? Rachel, she's from JetBrains, and you're going to actually, we saved the best for last, I think, personally. Yeah. Um, so, you're going to talk about how to design and develop, like, accessibly. Yes. Accessibility way. Yes. Ness. Like, okay, cool. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Accessibilities. I don't know. Yes. Cool. Very cool. Um, so, why don't you just take it away? All right, sure. Uh, so, this talk title is uh, Be an Ally. And with Ally, it is often abbreviated as A11Y for accessibility. And you'll see this in a few different areas of software. Uh, so that's some popular nomenclature in uh, accessibility design. So what we're going to do is talk about a few things, since we only have 30 minutes, that you can do that are pretty easy to be able to make your site accessible for many, many users out there. And I'll let you know why and how as we go along. So um, first off, why should we care about accessibility? Because it is much more than a disabled parking spot, right, and a little sticker in the car window. That's the first thing everyone thinks about accessibility. Well, we have a parking spot out front, aren't we good? Right? Nobody thinks about it on the web. And it is actually very, very important to think about it on the web and in apps as well. A lot of this applies in both lands, web and app. Okay. So it is the right thing to do. And you know it, right? Don't pretend you don't. You do, right? Uh, it's the right thing to do. You are able to reach all the people you need to reach, even the people that it might be difficult to reach. Uh, if you're not convinced about that, you or a loved one absolutely will in your life have an accessible need. Uh, many people do now, a staggering number of people, but at some point it's gonna be you. Uh, everybody dies and if you think you're not going to, you're probably delusional enough that maybe software also isn't for you. Right? <laughs> Just that's, you, we're going to die, I hate to tell you about that. And, End of life is going to be a time when you really, really, really need accessibility, along with illness, accidents, and lots of uh, other things that happen in life, including aging as well. So if you live a nice long life to 90, that's awesome, but you're going to need a little help there. Still not convinced? How's this? All right, there's money in this. <laughs> So you're doing the right thing, and you could end up with a pile of cash. How's that? Because over a billion people with $1.2 trillion of disposable income have accessible needs. And when you inc incorporate in their loved ones, that goes up to $8 trillion. So is that good enough for you? If you're all like, hey, you're being all PC with this right thing to do and blah, blah, blah. Well, how about the money then, right? Do it for the money at least, right? So there's a, a good reason. And this is from Forrester. Uh, in the US, there's 62.8 million Americans that require assistive technology. So even if you're like, well, I don't do stuff worldwide. Um, you only need to do stuff for the USA. Well, great, but that's still a lot of people, right? If that's a dollar a person of revenue you have, that's a lot of money. Uh, there's very many different categories of things that people need for accessibility needs. So 25% have a vision difficulty, a uh, quarter also have dexterity difficulties, and we have hearing difficulties. 35% uh, of entrepreneurs are dyslexic. Right, and 20 in the UK. So that's a few stats, uh, mostly from the American side of things. That translates out to a lot of cash as well. And of course, those baby boomers, right? And then following them, what is it, Gen X after that or something? Uh, they have uh, over 65. They're rising, right? And medicine's getting better. So even though we are still going to die, uh, we're, you know, you're going to get pretty old. And what happens when you get old? You're going to have to face this. You may lose short-term memory, vision, hearing, fine motor function, things that today's technology re 
fire. All right, so those things uh, gets a little bit harder when you get older, and I can vouch for this myself. Um, you know, I'm up getting there in old person territory, and I noticed it's harder to, you know, fine tune. Stop laughing at me, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing at it on the air. <laughs> um, so, I, like, I noticed it's harder to fine tune, click on, you know, an exact pixel with the mouse uh, or even a trackpad. And things, you know, I, I need to do um, the thing with the glasses where you have to take them off to read something in front of your nose or you have to stretch your hand out really far to see something on your phone. So those guys, you know, I actually had the talk about progressive lenses with the ophthalmologist. I was like, no. <laughs> so it's that milestone. It, you're going to get there. And it might not be vision, but it, it will be something. So... Okay, you say, well, you know, but that's that's the thing. There's better glasses out there and, and whatnot. But but look at here's what customers want uh, as far as accessibility goes. Right, what they want is not better glasses per se. And have you looked at prices of glasses in the U.S.? These things are expensive. Uh, but what they want isn't necessarily newfangled accessibility technology. But they want you to write better software. Imagine this. As software developers, you may have heard this before, right? People want better software. And accessibility is a big part of what they want. So, and in this case, the last, um, this might not be the most recent poll, but it's just, you know, going in that direction still. Over 80% wanted more accessible websites uh, because developers like flashy things or are more interested in clean code. And that is a great thing to do, but then you do it at the expense of people actually being able to use your software. And it's been said, shipping is a feature. Shipping for everybody should also be a feature. Uh, so the types of accessible needs, there's four general categories. Uh, visual, auditory, motor, and cognitive. The bulk of your work, if you're a developer, is going to be in the visual area because the web is very largely visual. But there are a few things you can consider, um, maybe not so much coding practices, but consider for the other three. There will be some coding practices for visual. Uh, the first thing we'll take a look at is that access assistive technology. Uh, so there is a picture of me on the left where somebody else took a picture of me highlighting the menu with the phone because old person can't see it. It was dark, right? How many times did somebody do this out at dinner, right? You have to highlight the menu. Uh, or even trackpads. Guess why they're even a thing? Oh, sure. It, it wasn't just a cool thing. It was for accessible needs. And of course, glasses. A lot of people say, but but I'm really young and I don't need them. And they're wearing glasses. And I'm like, but you're actually wearing assistive technology now, right? As I am. Glasses and all, I still can't see the menu. So sometimes you're already using the assistive technology and you don't even know it. Uh, did you use an escalator today? Guess what? That's technically an assistive technology. Uh, it's not always high tech. It's not always a spaceship. Uh, the ones that we tend to think of when we think of like a disability or something about accessibility are things like the screen readers, braille readers, uh, those kind of things, maybe a, a like a braille reader, uh, sip and puff switch, single axis switches, uh, eye tracking eyeglasses, or adaptive keyboards. So there's a few examples of the technology that many people are using to access your software and you might not even know it. Right, um, We do have these people, and they may be struggling to use your software, and in many, many cases, they end up being so frustrated that they just abandoned popular sites. And I remember looking into some data with mobile app development a while back when uh, smartphones were becoming kind of a thing, and they said, like, look, if the page takes more than two seconds to load, like 70 some percent of the users just dump it and they're like, oh, forget that. And they just go somewhere else. They won't download the page, they won't surf there, they're, they're done. Uh, even on a regular computer, how many times it takes more than two seconds to load. Right, so people get frustrated quickly with technology 
uh, especially people who may not have wanted to use it in the first place, and they have to. And if you don't perform well, they're not going to use it, right? So these are things we have to consider. These people are your users. Whether or not you plan for it, they are, or at least they're trying to be. Uh, but you might be losing them, and with that, a lot of money. Uh, Xbox knows this, so that's one of the adapt adaptive controllers for Xbox, right, for accessibility needs, and one of the designers uh, talking about it. Uh, and there's the tweet that that goes to. Let's take a look specifically now at these categories. We'll start with visual, which there's four kind of areas inside of there. Uh, low vision, uh, so that would be me, right? Uh, standard, you know, I'm getting older, can't see stuff. Um, then blindness, color blindness, and color contrast sensitivity. Now, you could consider yourself perfectly not disabled whatsoever, but color contrast is something that tends to hit everybody. Uh, if you have bad contrast, nobody can read your stuff. Or they can, but it's, it's literally painful for some people. Uh, so, one thing that we have is screen narrators. Uh, so I have my Mac here, so I have voiceover, which works pretty well. But also there's NVDA, very popular. Uh, Web Anywhere, also a couple of browser-specific ones. Uh, VoiceOver is not browser-specific. That little um, point just got tabbed in a bit. So we do have these various screen readers. These are generally free. There's also some experimental ones and some that you can pay for as well. But if you want to test and just get a feel for what it's like, and I highly suggest people do this, Download like NVDA or Web Anywhere, or if you have a Mac, use Apple VoiceOver. Go browse the web with your eyes closed and see how far you get. See if you can understand even a simple page that you use every day and what's going on. If you lost your site tomorrow, would you be able to use those sites? And you're going to find out that the answer to this is no in many, many instances. Uh, so we will work with them at some point, or you should have people that test with them uh, at some point, and if possible, uh, visually impaired people. So the first thing that we can do to help screen narrators is this thing called a skip link. Now, what could be more annoying if you cannot see a page, and you know pages are full of things nowadays. They're not a tiny little page with just four or five blinking elements like they were decades ago. Um, there is just all kind of content things popping up, ads here and there, you know, even if you have an ad blocker, sometimes things squeak through, and there's a lot of links. And what happens is when the user enters a page, the narrator, uh, not all narrators, they don't all work exactly the same, but many of them will read off the top bar of links or the side bar of links. And when they do that, um, it'll read it off, and then they click on a link and go to that page, and then it has to read those links again before it gets to the content. And then if they go somewhere else, it reads the links again. And this gets to be annoying pretty quickly. So something you might consider is skip links. Now, some of the assistive technology is getting a little bit better in that they are able to figure out with semantic HTML that there is a section of links and they just skip over it, but uh, just like with accessibility, you do have to support older browsers as well. So if you're still supporting IE8 and some of those older browsers, you might need to have skip links for those. Newer stuff uh, and newer designed, you know, using HTML5, semantic web, that sort of thing, is generally a little bit better in this category. Uh, but we still got to support the old stuff. It, and it's easy enough. Here's what you do. The first thing that shows up in a page is going to be an anchor, and it's going to have its href set to a named area or named link. Then somewhere in the page where somebody would be able to skip over the navigation bar and go to, you have that named area or link in the page. Uh, so here in the sample, you know, I just have a class that says skip domain content, and then the main content, which is either a named link or a semantic main tag. Right? Either one works. Um, so this, when this happens, 
then the screen narrator can sit on the skip link and then that person that is not cited well can then hit the tab key and then just skip down to the content and just go right past all of the links. Now, a few things you can do with this. One is if you have the links present and visible, fine, that's great. Uh, but sometimes people have links not necessarily as the first set of things in the page because uh, it does have to be right up there in the beginning. Uh, so what we might want to do is a little bit of a small hack. And that is to put the links in the beginning, but to make them hidden. Now when you make them hidden, you just make them a one pixel wide, one pixel high, and set the left way out into left field. So there it's like minus 10,000. Uh, then this way, it'll just push the links out, but still in the DOM, because if you set visibility to hidden, uh, then it won't, screen narrators won't pick it up. Uh, if you set, you know, any kind of the visible properties, it won't. If you set the width and height to zero, it won't pick it up. Uh, so you want screen narrators to pick it up. So if you set CSS for those links, then um, you can just shove them out in left field. They're out of sight, but the screen narrator can read it and then people could skip over it. Now, if you're using something like Bootstrap and if you're using, if you're a .NET person, which you probably are if you're here at .NET Conf, then with Bootstrap, they have an SR-only class. And with that, uh, you can just set your nav portion, like the whole div that contains your links to that, and that will hide it uh, if you need to. Uh, there's also some landmarks that you can use if there's no semantic HTML and you have a very, very old site with mostly old browsers to use. Uh, so skip links are pretty easy. You could just do an SR only in there. So that's just a little bit of HTML. Uh, if I go and I take a look at, say, um, a Razor Pages sample, like a small Razor, Razor Pages website, and I go into the layout page, uh, here's where you can actually put something like that, right? I might have my div with a couple of links inside of it, and I could class that as SR only because this uses Bootstrap, right? So then that would pick that up. If I didn't want to do that, that's fine. Uh, here we're using nav anyway, so nav is semantic HTML, so that should work just fine. Right? Uh, so here I have my uh, different links, and Bootstrap can pick that up and decide if it needs to display or skip or whatever. So that'll be good for the screen readers. Uh, also, you notice things like the main and other, you know, footer, header, uh, those semantic elements, having those helps with the screen narrow. There's also an accessibility plugin for Bootstrap, so that will help you along with that. Um, past screen narrators, there's much more you could do, but we only have 30 minutes. So we'll take a look at these other factors here, like color blindness. Uh, here's a, a really easy low hanging fruit thing you could do. Download this thing called Color Oracle. And when you do that, uh, I could come over and take whatever sample uh, web page that I want and let me run this and then what you can do with color oracle and I think I'm gonna have to go maybe launch my color oracle and now I can't find it oh here it is there we go there it is so it should show in Windows in your tray in Mac it'll show up in in the little Mac area here and what you could do is here I have several colors, right? Your classic red, blue, green, yellow, right? Right out of the rainbow. And once I have that page up, I can just click on Color Oracle, and then I could pick one of the different color blindnesses that are available. And it'll show me what it looks like to those people. So something we could see here just by kind of scanning through the different color blindnesses that we have right, lacking red, lacking blue, lacking green, etc., is that a lot of people on a lot of websites will use a green button for OK and a red button for cancel. But if you do that, they don't look at all like this, or maybe up to 5% of the population. And if you take, say, the U.S. has 330 million people, so that's a lot of people. That's several million people 
that don't see red or green and it looks like these colors here so um, you might want to consider not using color as the primary indicator of what something does use you can have color in your buttons or whatever but also use text or something else to denote what it does so you can get this nice little tool and then you can run this through any web page to see what it's like as a matter of fact facebook is blue the color that it is because mark zuckerberg has one of the um, color blindnesses uh, there's also a cool accessibility color wheel tool so designers and developers can work together on this one and you just pick out your foreground and background and it'll tell you if it's good or not and you can pick out different contrasts and, and it you know adheres to WCAG and all that good stuff so that's a nice easy tool to use and there's also a color blindness simulator so you can uh, go to the simulator and it does something similar to what the color oracle does uh, but here you could take a sample photo and you could just click around in it and see what it looks like you could upload your own photos so if you have a photo heavy site that will give you the view of somebody who has a color blindness uh, so you can help design much better now color contrast is something that affects nearly everybody uh, so we want to consider what's good contrast and bad usually nice and light on dark or nice and dark on light uh, but also sometimes the colors themselves so here's bad contrast a lot of people won't even be able to see this at all like that's just crap uh, here's good contrast right you can see that uh, here's like eh, eh, eh it's not great really it, that could be way better uh, this is very good right black on a nice light blue uh, now this is horrible actually looking at the monitor I could see it on my laptop but I literally cannot see any text on the screen in this studio so that's terrible contrast there was some good contrast right and then again this is just so bad your eyes are bleeding at this point like this and I see this everywhere if you do this you're a terrible person I'm sorry that is just awful uh, here's good contrast right and then just another meh, not so like light gray on white. I know that's popular. It's not the greatest though. Um, nice red on white is good. Uh, but if you look at some of them, like that red on the green, it actually hurts your eyes when you look at it. Look, if your software is physically hurting people, you're a jerk. Like stop it. That is just not cool. All right. So look at these things and use, say, the color contrast contrast tool from WebAIM and that will help you sort out your colors and if your designer did that go give them a slap that's not right they shouldn't be doing that uh, as far as screen readers go uh, so you can take any screen reader and, and kind of practice with it so if we are using things like semantic html this helps now if we're using net also um, not only do the templates for the asp.net core and asp.net projects have semantic html but when you use data annotations that produces the correct html and javascript so the screen narrators can pick that up uh, so if i were to run something like that and just launch my site somewhere where i can maybe enter some data and once i get to here if i go ahead and open say voiceover welcome to voiceover voiceover speaks description okay so VoiceOver does cool things. Oh, I forgot to actually. <laughs> there we go. I keep forgetting to click use on it. It doesn't it though? <laughs> these, these are pretty robotic. So this one goes fast because if it went slow, people would be on the page all day. But as you tab through, so you'll see it does. Okay, so as you can see, as I go through and I tab through, it starts to tell you what you're doing and where you're at. 
Uh, and again, if you're using um, like scaffolding to scaffold your pages, like I did with this one, and data annotations, this is going to pick all of that up and it's going to be able to effectively read what's on the screen. And as you can see, even though it's for uh, folks with sighted disabilities, it does give you a little blurb at the bottom in text as well. And uh, so if I look at my Except data annotations, Rider. Project. System preferences. Except. okay, we don't need it to narrate inside of Rider or anything like that, we're good. Uh, so here, right in my model, right, I can come in here and just set the data types correctly so I have dates and it knows it's just a date not the time as well and the display name so it the screen reader can pick that up and in annotations that just gives us all of the information when it produces the rendered output screen narrators are very happy about that um, so there I have those so that works out really good uh, for accessible forms uh, so you can see we'll take a look at the form here if you have things like the checkboxes and lists and grouped items, you could use the field set and legend. Uh, but in this case, I didn't have any. I just had a just plain form and a couple of divs that were grouped here. So there's one grouping for the name, one for the enrollment date, one for the expected graduation date for the students. And something that I did here on purpose so we could see how it works. If you notice, all of these except the last one have the label All right so that's a semantic html element uh, and the label tells the screen narrator what this is about so previous days we would just use a span or uh, some other kind of little tag to be able to kind of label our input elements but now what we could do is say input and then use our asp4 and then go ahead and say label asp4 and point that to our input Right, or actually the same actual model item, right? So our little object right out of the model. And then that's all gonna work seamlessly together for us. Uh, and I really, I didn't have to do anything. This was all created when I ran scaffolding. Right? So you, really you get free stuff here. It's a boatload of free stuff. Now I came in here and I removed this label. So what would happen if I removed this label and I get to that element, so if I come back here and turn to voiceover. voiceover back voiceover on. Voiceover on Chrome. Edit text blank. That's it. We're currently on a text field. Thank you. To enter text in this field. Type. Thanks. Yeah. Great. A text field. What text field? I don't know. It's not labeled. I took the label out. So even if there's some text ahead of there, the narrator might not pick that up or know. It might see the text, but it won't know that it belongs to this text box. So it just goes edit text field. You're on a text field. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. That's not helpful whatsoever. So you want to use the labels and uh, appropriate scaffolding there. PowerPoint. I PowerPoint gotta turn that back off again. <laughs> Every time. So yeah, and you can see how annoying this could get if you are somebody with sighted needs, right? So, uh, so there we have the label again, and also some things that we tend to do. Uh, people tend to put a tiny little star and that's all to denote required and they'll make it red which is two bad things right the red because uh, our colorblind folks can't see it uh, also it's tiny a tiny star that sometimes looks like a speck of dust on the screen so you know um, other sighted needs can't see it uh, so what we might want to do if you're actually going to use the word required or if you're going to actually denote that something is required instead of waiting for them to get to the end and then popping up the messages uh, then you can actually just put the word required or something that's a little bit more clear than the star uh, so that tends to be much more helpful uh, there's also a little uh, tool tip that you can create and the oaa accessibility project has that available so you could go there and they have some sample HTML to pop up a tooltip. Uh, and then of course the folks in the accessibility circles argue our tooltips are really accessible. But these are built pretty well, so they don't get in the way. Uh, the other thing with accessible forms, you will see something called ARIA. Now, ARIA was more needed in the past. You will need it today once in a while when semantic HTML is not really relevant for what you're doing, 
uh, or if you have to support some of the older browsers or browsers that don't support HTML5. Right? So if that happens, you may need some of these ARIA tags. Uh, as technology is evolving, these tend to be going away a little bit. So you can set an ARIA required if you needed to do that, and that would give the screen narrator a little assist. It would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I see that's required. I can uh, tell the user that. And there's a full set of ARIA attributes that you can apply to any HTML tag. And of course, that also works for any Razor markup as well. Uh, and they have roles, states, properties as well. So you can say if things are disabled or if it's supposed to be navigation versus content required, etc. So it just helps the narrators. You will, um, the uh, narration. So you'll see a few of these in the templates for ASP.NET Core projects with Razor pages. Now there's more things you can do for sighted people or people with sighted issues. Um, that's just a few of the big bangs for the buck. It's not a lot of coding to do, but it helps tremendously for, for folks. Uh, so we'll go into auditory and the next three categories are a lot less coding, but just being aware of what's happening out there and who is accessing your software. So auditory is mild hearing loss to total deafness. Um, so that's generally what that is. Um, now, some things just to take note of. Don't rely only on sounds for feedback. That does happen. Sometimes it happens in games or more in app development, desktop kind of stuff. Uh, use transcripts and closed captioning wherever possible right? because not everybody could hear. Actually, I'm seeing many, many more people who can hear perfectly well. And they say, I actually prefer to just not blast the TV and I like to have closed captioning on or folks who are learning languages uh, just like to run captions as well. And it helps out a little bit to hear it and to read it at the same time. Uh, know about deaf culture. There, it is such a thing, right? Uh, sign languages, there, it, and it's not sign language, it's sign languages. There are dialects and sign languages, and people do have accents in sign language. So if you do get interpreters that do signing, uh, that's just something to consider. Right, that it, it's out there. So you might have a signer for one of your videos or something like that, um, but they may have an accent or something. And if they're not from your area uh, and you're localized, some people might notice that. So just so you know, it's available out there. Uh, the motor and dexterity issues. All right, so this is generally illness, injury, disease. There's many. Uh, if you think about it, things like epilepsy and uh, seizure disorders, right? A lot of websites have like a loud, you know, pulsating, weird, like psychedelic stuff going on, and it just like kind of goes all over the place, and people actually have seizures. Uh, I know The Simpsons did an episode and they kind of like made a big joke about it, but it seriously actually happens. Uh, there's also motor dexterity as you get older right? if you look at many of us have you know very aging parents and they have tremors uh, essential tremor is something anybody of any age can have plus actual diseases like parkinson's and whatnot uh, you can have dexterity issues and something i see this drives me up the wall uh, and i'm not the only one You'll go to a popular website and they'll pop up an ad. Well, first of all, the fact that it's an ad, right, is just <laughs> wrong right there. It's so annoying. But then they'll make the close button like two, a two pixel by two pixel button. And you basically have to be a surgeon to be able to click on that button. And it is really annoying. And then people just go, forget this. And they just don't come back to your site. So where you think you're being clever and you're trapping them in there, they're just going like, F you, and they're going to another site because you've just made them very, very angry. Um, so, uh, so all these things can, all these kind of people are using your software. Um, arthritis, how, arthritis is super common. Lots of people have arthritis, and it actually is sometimes painful uh, to try to click on that little square or to try to use just the mouse. So make sure there's always alternative keyboard input. Right, so that's something. And that the tab order is not ridiculous, that it goes in a logical fashion. People forget to check the tab orders on forms. 
Uh, also, temporarily, like I said in the beginning, you will at some point, or a loved one will have these needs. You break a bone. Right? That's very common. People, that happens. Uh, you break a bone. That can cause uh, an impact on your technology use. Also, sprains and lots of other stuff, right? People even just get, you know, frozen shoulders or lots of joint problems, and, and it's just part of aging or injury. And then from that, uh, just makes it a little harder to use devices, right? So phones, computers, or anything. Uh, so make sure, oh, also, Alt, right? So alternate keyboard and Alt in images as well. So uh, lots of things. Avoid pop-ups and modal dialogues unless they're easy to get out of. Uh, nice big close buttons or where somebody can just click away or move away and it easily goes away. Uh, cognitive impairments as well are very common. Uh, everything from just, you know, memory's not so good anymore, right? That's, you know, also an aging issue. Uh, and remember the millions of people aging in the U.S. Uh, autism, seizures, uh, just comprehension and learning disabilities, dyslexia, ADD, that's very, very common. Uh, so these are all users, right? So if you look at this, this is a significant portion of the population between visual, auditory, dexterity, and cognitive, right? You're talking like a quarter of the population at any given time, uh, all the way up to almost 40% in some areas. So there's a huge chunk that has something going on or multiple things from these areas going on. Uh, so uh, that's something. So there's no tools to help people with the cognitive disability for you to write code to make it easier for them. What you need to do though is just keep things clear and simple, right? Which as a programmer you are supposed to be doing, right? There is a KISS principle and you're supposed to be doing it in your code and it should be in your product as well. Um, but also programmers tend to, you know, poo-poo the UX, right? Like, oh, it's not my job and stuff like that, but it kind of is. You're building the product and people are using it. And if they can't, you are partly responsible. Uh, so you need to make sure that comprehensive UX testing gets done and not just with two people who you think are the average user. You need to get a nice variety of users in there because of these massive percentages of people with various disabilities. Right? So no tools per se to help, just that you need to keep things in order, keep it clear and simple, keep it easy to use, uh, listen to your users when they say, this is not easy to use. Uh, something that's not usually categorized as a uh, disability, but it is an interesting thing that researchers have found as part of the human spectrum of being and living. And that is a thing called synesthesia. So there are these number of synesthetes out there with these various ways that they experience the world that is different from what you would use or call, uh, in quotes, normal. Uh, one of them is the graphene color synesthesia, which is the picture, that colored picture. And when, whenever somebody talks about numbers, if they said picture 1 to 100, that is what would show up in their head. The one also to the right is the spatial sy sequence synesthesia, and I actually have that, right? So when I see numbers, I see them in a certain, not with the cool colors though, uh, but I do see them in certain patterns or ladders and time, uh, dates and times, I see in like circular patterns when uh, that's how I experience time. Uh, so people experience things differently. Uh, other ones, like when they hear sounds, they experience a color or a taste. And often letters, like I have the word synesthesia, uh, somebody might see every S as red, every you know H as purple, and it'll be consistent, right? So every time they, so you might be reading black on white text. Somebody else might see a pretty big rainbow going through a page of a book. So there's all these different ways that people just simply experience the world not a disability, it's just a different way to experience. Uh, which is also how I see autism, just a different way to experience the world, right? Uh, so a lot of these things. Also when people, sometimes when they touch things, different textures, they will feel a taste, or feel a taste, right? They will taste something when they feel a texture, 
or you know when they hear certain sounds they might have a taste like so all, all kind of these weird and different kind of crossed perceptions uh, so those are those four main categories and some things you can do as a programmer uh, as far as some general tools to help us out um, web aim is where you want to go this is a good one-stop place to go so if you go to web aim they have this cool thing called a wave scanner so you could go plunk in a URL. You can even download this as a toolkit, and it will just go through and tell you all the things that are, you know, that you can change to make it more accessible. It looks for alt tags and all kind of interesting and cool stuff. All right, so you can just pop in a website and uh, see what it says. So I could even like pop in my own blog here, and then give it a second, and it'll parse it, and then come up with some ideas. So here it'll actually give you errors, alerts, uh, tells you where you're using ARIA and not, and some things that you can do better, right, that, that you have in here. So that's a, a very handy tool. Uh, there's also the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They have a checklist. So when you go to uh, publish, you can go through the checklist, see what's out there. Uh, also, depending on where you live and what sector you're in, if you're in government, most certainly you have to do this. Uh, so it just depends. There's Section 508 for the U.S., and Europe has um, some rules about this too, and also the WCAG2 checklist. So there's two of them as, that you can use in there. Uh, the bottom one is a little bit newer, but these are checklists that just allow you to go through and uh, make sure that you have everything that you should and get all your ducks in a row. You can actually say, oh, make sure I have alternative text. Make sure everything is clear. Uh, I have my alt attributes. And here's inputs have labels. Uh, deform buttons have a descriptive value. So all these cool little things so you don't forget. Right? Uh, so that's very, very handy as well. So I like that quite a bit. Uh, so web aim in general is just a really good um, place to go. There's also the ally project. Uh, so if you just look for a 11y project the first thing that pops up and they have all kind of cool samples and things like that and places you could go to to do a little bit more coding and much more than we could possibly talk about here today in a half an hour which i'm probably late. <laughs> maybe something like that no idea when we started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay so um some final thoughts on this um also Right, and this is right from Web Content Accessibility. Right, for the love of God and all that is holy, get over yourself, stop dragging your heels, and make the shit you create accessible. Bleep, um, and seriously, actually, freaking care about it as well. Yeah, it's gonna get bleeped later, isn't no. it? Oh, okay, cool. So, really, this is what WK finally got fed up with all your BS developers because you don't do any of this, right? People just let this, you know, to the last thing if they even get around to it. Uh, but a lot of people simply can't even use your software at all. So, uh, like I said, if you don't care about the right thing to do or that it might even affect you if you think it won't, um, how about the money? Go after the money, right? And WCAG wants you to do it as well. So, it's right up there on their on their check or on their wish list and their actual draft specs which i think is kind of hilarious but uh sad that it needed to be said uh, right and here i gave you just a few simple things you could do that will really enhance accessibility in your projects uh, and there's of course a lot more you could do uh, if you go to web aim you'll find that out right. and i think i'm pretty much done there sweet all right well, we do have a couple questions yep so let's let's go let's just a couple here um one here actually is right in the chat window there. Question, the Google Live Transcribe app is awesome. Are there any other available to be used in Windows or the browser extension? The Google Live Transcript app. Transcribe app. Oh, Transcribe app. I'm not sure if there's a um, comparable piece of software out there for that particular. Okay. Um, another one I got in a whisper was, um, <laughs> Was a, a ver I'm going to ask you to verify a link, I guess, for uh, they were asking about an accessibility uh, for Windows apps, okay. actually, because you talked a lot about web apps, all, yeah. all about web apps, um, and was wondering if, you know, was there a more up-to-date piece of software than the one, I mean, piece of documentation than the one here um, that looks fairly old to me, too, um, but um, 
I feel like a lot of these design concepts are sort of, they sort of like live longer than the operating uh, systems. That's themselves. what I was going to say, because yeah. it's a design concept. Yep, so I was actually going to, when you started talking about Windows, point it to the actual um, Windows. Um. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> You're in the camera, dude. <laughs> Scott Hunter stuck Scott in here. Hunter has been standing here for <laughs> like a half an hour, just making sure I didn't mess this all up. I guess he's ready for keynote number three. I think the making sure I, I didn't I curse too that's much. That's right. Yeah. I was there at the beginning. I want to be at the end as well. So, so, um, so yeah. So sounds like uh, that was um, what was it? <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, that, sounds like give them everything that they need because a lot of that does have to do with uh, design and, okay. and whatnot. So all right, that cool. should help. Awesome. Yeah. All right, uh, I think that's that's about it. Mm -hmm. So I want before we wrap it up. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much. Before we wrap this whole show up, um, I did want to say thank you so much to all of the people who have stuck through the whole show all the way to the end, even a half an hour late. Okay, we actually have a couple awesome people, like literally the average like duration of time watched, I have a couple stats here, of the whole entire show, um, 265 minutes in Trinid a Trinidad and Tobago. Like they all, like all three people watch the show for <laughs> like days on, on end. Um, I wanted to, I just wanted to thank you. The, the <laughs> second one, Cabo Verde cool. and the third, Isle of Man. Fourth, Kenya. At 122 minutes straight watch. So that, those were long, you know, one That's full session. To be fair, though, Isle of Man yeah. is, is probably one aisle yeah. with a man on it. I don't know. Literally a just a man there. That's it. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just next to England. And, you never know. And everybody else is on the main England. It could have been a main, girl watching. I don't know. Um, I'm hoping. Um, so anyways, uh, great show, everybody, and we really super appreciate it. Javier, get into the shot here. You've been the man man running this whole Twitch thing, too. You and Jeff. Yes, thank uh, you. Jeff took off to TwitchCon. <laughs> right. So, yeah, Jeff dumped on and, us. And, you know, he totally dumped us for TwitchCon, but that's cool because you know, we, we need him to create some more mods for our awesome mm -hmm. Twitch stream for you. Right. So huge thanks to everybody who tuned in on all three days. Thank you so much for making this fun. This is uh, year number six for .NET Conf. Wow. I was going to say for Javier, I you've been here it was when, even longer. when this started as ASP.NET Conf. <laughs> oh, right. So yeah. So this yeah. is year number nine for the virtual one. So next year, we got our big number 10. Right, Let's come over here, Mr. Mr. Come Hunter. Here, Mr. Ooh, big party next Mr. year. Come on, come on, come on, here. Come on here. Oh, Myra's here. Come on here. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I wasn't this wasn't the first one your idea? Yes. Yep. So, so, All right, duck so the, we're this on the whole camera. thing started with Javier nine years yeah. ago. Yeah. That's, so what, yeah, that, that's what kicked this off. And right? then marketing took over and made it huge. Made it big. Right. <laughs> she did this. Best brought the power <laughs> of the force. <laughs> So, and thank you, Scott Hunter, for actually building a product this year. We had a launch event. Yes. So awesome, awesome. dude. Thank you very much. High five. High five. Bye. Low five. Low five. Low five. Low five. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. You made it successful. It's the best one yet. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Woo! See ya. I got to go shoot the camera off. <laughs>